Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well, and welcome to another uh, five webinar. I am Joelle Briere, and this is Victoria Wushner, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'm Victoria. I'm a co-founder of Five with Joelle and President. And um, before we hop in, I'd love to just share a little bit about Five for anybody who is not quite familiar yet. Um, so our mission at Five is to help shepherd 5MEO DMT into the world in a safe and effective manner, starting with a centralized hub for resources and education on 5-MeO DMT, engaging in clinical research and working towards FDA approval. Our website includes over 30 plate pages of free information on 5-MeO DMT, including integration specialists, monthly webinars, scientific research, and more. In addition, 5 is known as the gold standard in 5-MeO DMT trainings, bringing together over 35 guest teachers and speakers over the course of nine months to provide students with the best education possible. And uh, 5 emphasizes and encourages a collaborative approach to this work and is proud to partner with individuals and organizations working to a similar cause. And we're so happy today to have Haley with us. Really looking forward to, to hearing all of your work and your research. And for those who don't know Haley yet, um, Haley, Haley Duran, is a PhD student in the Drug Use and Behavior Lab at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Her work focuses on understanding how psychedelics can induce lasting change in people's lives from a neurophenomenological perspective and how they compare to other extreme experiences, particularly psychosis. She is currently conducting an interview-based study on how people with a history of psychosis respond to psychedelics, which is being funded by the Source Research Foundation. She is also utilizing real-time fMRI neurofeedback in the post-acute post effects of psilocybin to understand more about how the flexibility within key large-scale brain networks might change after psilocybin-assisted therapy. In addition to this, she recently proposed self-entropic broadening theory as a potential as a potential to transdiagnostic mechanism of how psychedelics can facilitate enduring change and also compare to psychosis. And she's also written on the potential mechanism and risk of 5-MeO DMT. Thank you so so much for being here, <laughs> Haley. <laughs> yeah, great to have you. And um, I'll hand it off to Joelle for the rest. All right. So first, just a fun little disclaimer. Five is focused on providing the world with resources to educate, inform, and promote harm reduction. The content of this webinar has not been evaluated by the FDA. 5-MeO-DMT <laughs> should not be used to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. Five does not endorse or promote the use of 5-MeO-DMT and does not encourage nor condone any illegal activities. You are solely responsible for understanding and complying with all laws that may be applicable to you. All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, <laughs> um, how it's gonna flow tonight for this webinar. Uh, Haley here is going to uh, give her presentation and then it will be followed by Q and A. So if you have questions, please leave them in the comment section and we'll get to them during that time. And uh, anything else? I don't think so. Awesome, awesome. Well, Haley, I'm gonna go ahead and make you the host so you can, uh, where did it all go? Ah, uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not the most technological savvy person yeah. in the world. And let's pin her too. Yeah, thanks for reminding me because I almost forgot and you'd have to look at us the whole time. <laughs> All right, Haley. You know have control of the helm. <laughs> Over to you. Great. All right. All right, so we have a lot to cover tonight because I've kind of tossed in a bit of my research about everything, obviously focusing on 5-MeO-DMT because that's, you know, what 5 is about, but we're going to get into it, so lots to cover. Um, what's so fascinating to me about 5-MeO-DMT and what really sparked my interest in it is that it's so rare compared to other psychedelics out there. And you can look at something like psilocybin mushrooms, and that's used in the U.S. by approximately 1 in 12 people. Even DMT, which is thought of as kind of a niche psychonaut substance, is used by approximately 1 in 1,000 people. In contrast, 
to find a person out in the wild who's done 5-MeO-DMT, you'd need roughly like the size of a very large college to find one person. So it's an extremely rare substance. Um, and this really shows that maybe there's something different, you know, going on. Why is it so niche? Um, so I, I find it very fascinating. And I think that's just an important thing to keep in mind is that we have all of this data on, you know, naturalistic use of psilocybin or even DMT. And with 5-MeO-DMT, like it's not, not as many people are as experimenting with it. Yeah. So that's interesting. And what's even more kind of fascinating about 5-MeO-DMT is in contrast to a lot of other substances out there, things like, or mixtures of substances such as ayahuasca or San Pedro or other substances, um, there doesn't really seem to be a clear history of indigenous use. Some people will say, you know, oh, Yopo seeds have some 5-MeO-DMT in it, but it seems like it's also with DMT and maybe it's not like the core component or whatever. So it's rare. Um, and, you know, there has been some pushes by certain people to say that there is an indigenous history, but it's not clear, especially with people actually using the totes. Um, but later on, of course, um, as Hamilton's psychopharmacopoeia um, discusses, uh, people did start milking and smoking the toads, but this was only being talked about in the 80s, so quite recently. And now there's really fairly rapidly a push to develop 5-MeO-DMT that has kind of happened in concert with the psychedelic renaissance. So this is quite exciting seeing something that was so, um, you know, only really a small people group of people were aware of it. And now it's becoming something, you know, scientists are investigating. So I find that really exciting. And you might think, oh, maybe there is more of a sort of buzz with 5-MeO-DMT. You know, Mike Tyson apparently has smoked it and talked about it. And there is some coverage of it in, you know, outlets like Vogue and, you know, of course, Hamilton Show. But still, if you look at the number of people searching it on the internet, it's still relatively not all that popular. Um, but maybe it's gaining interest a bit, I think, you know, amongst people in the psychedelic community, that definitely seems to be the case, but it's still definitely, I would consider sort of atypical in that regard. So why is there all this sort of excitement uh, about 5-MeO-DMT? Well, the thing with psilocybin, despite all its promise in clinical trials, um, you know, depression, alcohol use disorder, and all of that, is it's incredibly labor intensive for people to sit there for like six to seven hours, you know, two guides and all of this. And how does that really scale? How does that fit into the healthcare system? It's difficult to really know. Um, so a lot of people have sort of thought that 5-MeO-DMT might fill this gap by being, you know, more manageable from a time management perspective, um, sort of. And, you know, there are some initial studies suggesting it might be helpful for depression and then also, you know, more naturalistic sort of studies looking at mental health benefits in ceremonial settings. Um, what's interesting about this, though, is that I have yet to seen it sort of clarified why, you know, there's like, why is 5-MeO-DMT different than DMT for these different uh, indications and whatnot? So I, I'm really curious to see more work on that. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it later. But that that's something that we definitely will need to consider in the work moving forward. Why is 5 special compared to DMT? Um, and one of the reasons to me, it does seem quite different from other psychedelics and why I would consider it an atypical psychedelic. It is, it is, it is so much more selective for the 5-HQ1A receptor compared to the, the 2A receptor. Now, pretty much all the psychedelics out there, you know, LSD, DMT, psilocin, um, they all do have some affinity for both 1A and 2A, but the ratios are pretty similar. But with 5-MeO, it's not at all <laughs> similar. And you can see that it 
much more strongly binds to the 1A receptor. So if there's a low number for binding affinity, that actually means it's binding more. Um, some people might not know that. So that's very interesting. And it's quite bizarre because actually there's some work suggesting that typically 5-HU1A agonism is almost the opposite of 2A agonism. So you can give somebody an antagonist of 5-HG1A or a blocker of that receptor, and it will actually increase the psychological response to DMT, which is quite strange. Um, and similar studies have kind of shown that, you know, a 1A agonist will actually blunt some of the effects of psilocybin. So DMT is quite special and atypical in that it seems like what typically causes people to trip less is causing people to trip more with five, that, that 1A receptor agonism. So it's probably a different mechanism. But some people might be a bit puzzled by my focus on the 1A agonism because there's a lot of psychiatric drugs out there that aren't really uh, mind bending or strange in any way like buspirone, which have 1A agonism. But the thing that's interesting about the 1A receptor is that there's both pre and postsynaptic receptors, and it's not really clear which receptor 5-MeO-DMT um, is binding to most. But some of these more typical psychiatric drugs, it's often only like a full agonist at the presynaptic and maybe a partial at the postsynaptic, meaning it binds to that one less strongly. It might be different with 5. Perhaps 5-MeO-DMT is more of a full agonist at these postsynaptic receptors. Alternatively, something that's interesting to think about is that there's biased agonism. So this means that you can basically be activating a receptor in different ways where the signaling pathways are vastly different. Um, so maybe that's what's going on is fives fitting into these receptors in a way that's different than these other substances. And just to like really further that, you know, a 1A agonist, a predominantly 1A agonist would have a very different effect than a 2A agonist. You can see here with these receptor density maps that the 2A agonism or the 2A receptor is basically all over the whole cortex, right? So you have regions like that overlap with the DMN, and then you have the 1A receptor on this side it's more localized to temporal regions, right? So this region over here. So that's very different. And you would expect if you're activating um, or inhibiting different brain regions that the effects would be different. So, and just seeing those receptor density maps, um, I was, you know, interested, like what is the 1A receptor often thought to be involved with um, compared to like the 2A receptor and all this. and I came across a lot of work kind of suggesting that oftentimes the 1A receptor is actually implicated in epilepsy, especially temporal lobe epilepsy. So people have sort of mapped out which regions of the brain are causing epilepsy for people based on 1A receptor density. Uh, and this is oftentimes, you know, in those medial uh, regions. So over here, very different than, you know, the 2A receptor map. And it's interesting because 5-HG1A agonists can either be sort of pro or anti-convulsant. It's mixed, but it does seem to oftentimes be implicated in seizures. And what's strange about 5-MeO-DMT is even though, you know, the research looking at it from a clinical perspective and kind of treating it as a psychedelic is fairly new, is there's a lot of very early work from the 60s and 70s and 80s even, where people were sort of using it to understand more about the 5-HG1A receptor. And a lot of animals, uh, they noted, were kind of having seizure-like behaviors. So with sheep, a lot of sheep had sort of flailing movements and in some cases, respiratory failure. Uh, guinea pigs having myclonic behavior. So that's kind of like a jerking motion that is kind of associated with epileptiform or epilepsy-like activity. Um, 
in mice too, there's also been some sort of seizure-like behaviors, obviously in all these cases, because they weren't actually looking at the brains of the animals, they don't really know what's going on. Um, but in some instances, uh, there is actually a reduction in seizure-like behavior, but um, an increase, at least at a trend level, in seizure-like brain activity. So that's quite strange. Um, so it's interesting the way animals react, but it does seem in some cases to be seizure-like. And then also, unfortunately, there are cases of, or case reports of people, oftentimes children, finding a toad and deciding to put it in their mouth for whatever reason. And they, they don't, you know, meet the aliens or whatever, or see the machine elves, and so they end up going to the ER. Um, and in this case, at least, having convulsions. So that is a bit concerning. Some people might wonder, how is an inhibitory receptor, which the 5-HT1A receptor is an inhibitory one, promoting an excitatory event like a seizure? Um, well, one thing, well, one thing that's interesting is that a lot of the inhibitory sort of receptors are located on inhibitory cells. So what that means basically is that you are inhibiting the inhibitor. So it's like you're blocking yourself from being able to press on the gas pedal. And when you're blocking yourself from being able to press on the gas pedal, or sorry, not the gas pe pedal, the brake pedal, <laughs> um, when you're blocked from pressing on the brake pedal, you, you might speed up even more. Um, so maybe this is contributing to a lower seizure threshold, especially when you consider that there's also that 2A agonism and 5-HT7A agonism going on. Or alternatively, it might just be that 5 is having a very unique signaling cascade. So it's, you know, activating a different chemical pathway. But I think the core takeaway from this section is that 5-MeO and ENT, it does not seem to work the same way as other psychedelics, which have that sort of dominant 2A agonism. So 5-MeO-DMT, the phenomenology or people's descriptions of their inner experience, it, it's very different than other psychedelics. People oftentimes describe having a whiteout experience. So the first um, description of a whiteout experience I could find was in Chasha Shulvin's uh, book, TKAL. So quite early on, published in 1997, where he describes it as the most intense experience possible. And he says that he has little memory of the state itself, but experienced it as very, very profound. Um, so that's different than what you might expect from other psychedelics where it's like, oh, you're being shown like a whole different landscape of the world or having specific insights and whatnot. This is just a very intense state that he didn't remember. Um, other people have referred to 5-MeO-DMT as the God molecule. So maybe this is kind of a play off the spirit molecule. Uh, which people have called DMT, but it's interesting because for a lot of people, they seem to have like encounters with God or just a felt presence of God during their experience. And, you know, this sort of thing can happen with more typical psychedelics too, but it seems to especially happen, at least from the uh, trip reports that I've read with 5-MeO-DMT. It's often described as an experience that is like beyond human comprehension. And at the same time, people often feel like they're in a void and they might not even remember the experience. Um, and you can find that lack of memory of the experience um, in case reports and, or like trip reports. And you can also, there's actually in one of the um, early or recent studies um, in healthy volunteers, a lot of them were reporting that they were having some amnesic uh, effects. So that's interesting. So despite, it's strange, despite people not having memory of the experience, some still will say that they remember 
that it was very blissful and ecstatic or even orgasmic. Others are terrified of the experience and describe it as being overwhelmed. It's quite strange given that they oftentimes feel like there was a lack of experience, but at the same time, there was this strong um, affective component, which is very interesting. Um, so here's just another case report or trip report kind of describing somebody's experience as a mixture of pleasure and existential terror. Um, describing it as spiritually orgasmic and there being a spiritual slash physical sensation of release. Um, so that's interesting because to me, this seems to suggest that compared to other psychedelics, there is that more effective quality to the 5-MeO-DMT experience where that's central instead of it just being about like thoughts and insights. It's like you feel a difference somehow and that this a uh, very strong sensation has a spiritual component to it, which is interesting. Um, so the subjective effects in research settings. This to me is a bit of a mess and seems to suggest that we might not be measuring how, like what the 5-MeO-DMT experience is like um, in a good way yet. Um, so, in a study with healthy volunteers, many people were not reporting that they were having complete mystical experiences. Um, so that's a bit strange. And you can see like, this is the altered dimensions of consciousness scale. And even at higher doses um, in this study, many people weren't really maxing that out. And it was pretty low, lower than what you would expect for such a powerful experience, I suppose. Um, and even with the MEQ, so this is a, you know, in a lot of psychedelic research, people are always focused on this measure of the mystical experience. And it wasn't always really being maxed out. So that's strange. And yet in other settings, uh, like psycho-spiritual retreat centers, um, people are having very intense, highly uh, mystical experiences where it's kind of being maxed out. But I mean, this study was a little bit weird because they were doing 5-MeO-DMT right after doing Ibogaine. And if you know anything about Ibogaine, you know that it lasts a very, very long time. And I wonder if this was somehow changing the response to 5-MeO-DMT, uh, but I'm not sure. So with the... when people are just asked to compare it to other psychedelic experiences that they've had, most people say that it's more strong. So again, showing we don't really know what's going on. We can't measure it well, yeah, with the current tools people have been using. Um, so yeah, just psychedelic questionnaires are a very blunt proxy for capturing effects. You know, people can have mystical experiences with ketamine, of Ibogaine, these experiences are very different uh, subjectively and based on their like pharmacology than what you would see with a typical psychedelic. So, you know, what are these tools doing for us? We don't really know. And then there's aspects like, you know, if people are just having very salient, meaningful experiences and they're in an environment where it's, you know, they're at a retreat center or something like that, and they're not quite sure what to make of it. Are they just going to be like maxing out those questionnaires um, that are psychedelic-like, even if it's not really capturing their experience? Maybe. Uh, even when people are given a placebo, if they're put into a psychedelic environment, like the one shown in that Olson study, some people will say that they're experiencing psychedelic effects. So that's quite strange and just showing these current questionnaires probably aren't specific enough. Uh, people have tried to get around this by developing things like the peak experience scale. So measuring, was it an intense experience? Was there a sense of loss of control? Was it a profound experience? This isn't really what a peak experience is and could apply to really a lot of intense things out there in life. It could apply to somebody having psychosis. It could apply to somebody 
uh, having a seizure, all sorts of things. So it doesn't really help us understand, but people were, you know, maxing out the questionnaires uh, when given 5-MeO-DMT. So that's interesting. So getting out of the questionnaires, which are, I think, a problem right now, uh, how are 5-MeO, how is 5-MeO-DMT and DMT different? Uh, so there is that wide out experience, that sense of nothingness, and oftentimes a very like physical component to the 5-MeO-DMT experience. People are often sort of more unconscious um, or non-responsive with 5-MeO-DMT than DMT. Um, and I think it's more of an effective or an emotional experience for people uh, where, you know, DMT, you're going into another world, you might be meeting entities, you might, you know, be visiting some other place. And there's all those very interesting pseudo uh, visual pseudo hallucinations. And maybe people are having sort of more specific insights in that state because there's more content to it, but I'm not quite sure. But both experiences for people are often highly spiritual and mystical and can be overwhelming and profound. Um, and people describe altered, an altered sense of self. And, you know, they've also been compared to near-death experiences, both of them, but I don't really think they're too similar. So just again, showing that 5-MeO-DMT is different in how it feels. Uh, Hamilton Morris was basically saying that he felt sort of dissociated from his environment and became like really unresponsive at a higher dose. Um, and he also noted, as you'll see, if you watch his show, you'll see that some people do have uh, very intense physical reactions. So it's interesting. You don't really see that with DMT so much. So yeah, this this is something I think people should be aware of with 5-MeO-DMT. And it's not everyone, interestingly. There are some people, um, which a lot of people, you know, who are, are interested in 5-MeO-DMT might call Buddha sitters, uh, who don't really have any response. They'll just be completely still um, during their experience. But there's other people out there who are having, you know, twitching and jerking reactions, and they might be vomiting or uh, screaming even. And a lot of times they won't remember what they did afterwards. Um, it seems kind of outside of their control. Um, some people, based on reports on airway, have hurt themselves um, by accident while under the influence. So it's, it's strange. Um, yeah. And more concerningly, um, at least in some sort of naturalistic settings, there have been case reports of people having respiratory arrest. Um, so according to one person's sort of account of what they saw, somebody started convulsing. So we don't know if that's actually a seizure, right? Because we don't have the um, e like actual EEG data, but it, it, it looks like they were having a seizure and then they stopped breathing, and then a person began uh, doing CPR. Uh, the official, you know, cause of death makes it sound like it was anaphylactic shock, but I'm not quite sure that's the case because um, there are other instances of this being reported. And unfortunately, there are some people doing very um, controversial methods to restart uh, breathing, such as pouring water on people, which I I don't like in their throat. I don't think that's a good idea. That's that sounds terrible. Um, but yeah, it is definitely something to be aware of. Um, and what's interesting is it seems like for some people, temporal lobe seizures can actually produce respiratory arrest. So that is something to think about. Um, and some people might wonder, you know, maybe this is due to something else in toad secretions, you know, causing that reaction. And I would hope that was the case and people could get around it by, you know, using synthetic 5-MeO-DMT, which is much better for the environment and probably, I would guess, safer. But at least with the, 
the respiratory arrest component. I have read some um, instances where people have smoked 5-amino-DMT that's synthetic, it seems, and have stopped breathing. So this is in TKL, um, again, and Alex, or, yeah, Alexander Schulgen, he saw um, somebody just stop breathing. Um, and then afterwards, they sort of went into a psychotic-like state, maybe a manic state. It's kind of difficult to tell what exactly happened, but they were hospitalized and given antipsychotic medication, but they were able to sort of recover uh, right after. Uh, so three days for a psychotic episode really isn't consistent with somebody like developing like schizophrenia or something like that. So it's a bit weird. Uh, people can actually have um, psychosis from seizures, and I'm wondering if this sort of instance might be more like that. It's it's very difficult to tell, but it's just something to be aware of that this does happen and there are risks out there. So who knows? Another thing that I think might suggest that 5 DMT is special in some ways and maybe works partially through some sort of seizure-like mechanism is there's something called sensitization where Instead of having a tolerance when you're repeatedly giving a drug, you get more sensitive to it. Um, so seizures, oftentimes, there's a concept called kindling, where you have like one seizure, and then the next seizure is larger. Um, so that's kind of like a sensitization effect. And it seems like uh, with this study that this very early study in primates, very small study, that when they were repeatedly giving people or not people. <laughs> Monkeys, 5-MeO-DMT, um, they were having stronger behavioral effects. So that is different. That is not what you would expect with DMT or psilocybin or LSD. So again, suggesting whatever is going on here, it's not quite the same. And I think there's some hints that this might also, to an extent, be going on in clinical settings. So in a recent study where they were looking at people with depression, they found that what they called an individualized dosing regimen was more effective. And what was this dosing regimen? Um, basically, they would start people out with like a six milligram dose and then go to a 12 milligram dose uh, separated by three hours. And I think everybody only went to the 12 milligram dose or maybe like one person went to the 18, but most of them, uh, yeah, it was two doses and they were having a lot more of a response, um, like an improvement in their depressive symptoms and also a stronger compared to the people who just got one dose, even if that person who got one dose was given 18 milligrams. So the equivalent of the six and 12. So that's interesting to me and maybe suggests that there is some sensitization effect in people as well. And future studies, you know, might want to, instead of, ramping up the dose, just keep the dose the same and see if people are having a stronger experience over time. So it's interesting and, you know, might be suggesting that there's some sort of kindling light phenomenon going on or who knows. Uh, so one thing that like a lot of people are very excited about, you know, 5-MeO-D, DMT being more scalable. Um, but if multiple administrations are needed within a day and people are required to stay there all day, maybe not, maybe it's not really more scalable. I'm not quite sure. Um, and I'm kind of skeptical of this study only reporting a response for at least a week. I'm not quite sure what was going on there. Um, it's also important to consider that the study didn't really give people therapy. So that's a huge issue as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting. We'll see where the work with uh, treating depression goes. So are these experiences people are describing, are they seizure-like? Maybe. Um, I think there are some parallels with temporal lobe epilepsy, which as I mentioned earlier, the 5-HT1A receptors are 
sort of most located in the temporal lobes. So people with this form of epilepsy can have elements of a mystical experience, but oftentimes not all of a mystical experience. A lot of times people have a very strong sense of a spiritual awakening. Um, you might describe it as a near death like experience. Um, a lot of people have like an encounter with God or divine presence. There's a very religious quality oftentimes to people experiencing these seizures, which is interesting. And people also describe that more uh, sort of somatic, sensual, or even erotic uh, component, which is strange. And some people do have hallucinations as well. So very interesting. And I think, you know, if you don't know a lot about seizures, you might just think, oh, you know, to have a seizure, you need to be full on, like, on the ground, shaking, biting your tongue, all that. Not necessarily. Uh, most seizures aren't really sort of the tonic-clonic variety. People with temporal lobe epilepsy might not behave that way necessarily. Um, Doish Gillespie is a sort of famous example of a person that was thought to have um, temporal lobe epilepsy, and he definitely had some very um, interesting spiritual experiences to, to write about, so it's interesting. Uh, so what are people's experiences like with these seizures? People report that they don't fear death anymore, that they felt an unbelievable harmony of their whole body with like their life and all the world. So very mystical in quality. And some people, it seems, really enjoy these types of seizures and will actually try to purposely induce them, which is just fascinating. So it's not necessarily a negative experience for people. But in some cases, it is quite a negative experience. Some people, uh, roughly a third, experience what's basically like a panic attack-like reaction um, during the seizure itself. It's oftentimes a shorter duration than an actual panic attack, um, but it's especially common with temporal lobe epilepsy. And one sort of thing that's interesting about uh, people having these panic responses because it can be differentiated from a typical panic attack in that you know it's not responsive to therapy it's more responsive to like medication um and if somebody develops a panic attack over 45 years old and they've never had it before oftentimes it's thought to be um or not oftentimes but it can be uh more likely to be the development of a seizure disorder so something to think about um, and people who have these types of seizures, some of them will have very erratic behavior. You know, they might scream, they might cry, they might start laughing all over the place. They might just kind of sit there and stare out, maybe the, the booter sitter type of person, perhaps. Or, and a lot of times, uh, people will have like jaw clenching and movements, which I've seen that happen in videos of people doing 5 me Uh, some people will vomit which does happen with 5-MeO-DMT sometimes. So it's an interesting parallel, perhaps. So another interesting thing about 5-MeO-DMT is that people can have flashbacks or reactivations. So there's a lot of sort of issues about which term to use because um, in papers, you often read flashbacks slash reactivations or flashback like reactivation phenomena. And it's like, what is this? Um, there isn't really a precise definition of what a reactivation is. Um, and, you know, you can look at like the DSM 5 and HPPD, and it talks about people experiencing flashbacks and it defines it as the re experiencing of one or more of the perceptual symptoms. So oftentimes you might think of that as being visual. Since 5 meo DMT for a lot of people isn't visual, you know, maybe people don't feel like calling it a, a flashback um, and instead they're calling it this reactivation term. But I think in the future going forward, I'd love to see researchers and just communicators with 5 meo DMT being more clear about, you know, is it a flashback or reactivation and what are, what are the differences? Um, yeah. 
So is a reactivation, is that HPPD, hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder? My guess is probably not. Um, HPPD is experienced for many people for longer than a month and for some people years. It's also not very common for people to experience it. Uh, some people have estimated it's like 4% of psychedelic users with others pushing back and saying that's an overestimate. And to have HPPD, you have to be having distress uh, by the DSM's definition. Some people will say, oh, there is a HPPD type 1 and type 2, and the type 2 or one of, one of the types doesn't have distress, but that's a little um, not clear if that's a real thing. But anyway, people describe having these very uh, salient visual problems oftentimes. Um, and with reactivations, um, as I stated earlier, it's often not described as visual. And another thing is that for many people, not everybody who experiences a reactivation, it's really time course limited compared to HPPD. So it's only like one or two weeks um, after their experience based on existing literature. I've read people claiming that they were experiencing reactivations for like six months, but it doesn't seem very common. But what's strange about reactivations is that it, overall, they do seem pretty common with, you know, it varies by study, but between 72 to 73%, or the vast majority of like people using 5-MeO-DMT reporting this effect. Um, so that's different than the very rare HPPD, right? And then, at least based on a recent study, a lot of people are saying it's a positive experience for them. So that's that's not HPPD. So it's something else is going on. So what is it like uh, for people to experience reactivations? Obviously, it varies a lot, but. Uh, recently, I came across this article, which I thought kind of described somebody's experience well, and they described being woken up uh, sort of in the middle of the night, supposedly during REM sleep. I don't know how they knew they were in REM sleep, but um, basically they felt as if they had been catapulted into everything and also nothing. So that's a very um, sort of void-like experience. And this kind of woke them up out of their sleep and then they're struggling to find their like balance and out of breath, or at least they perceive themselves to be out of breath. So very intense experience, but not really a highly um, visual one, like what you would expect of HPPD. And it's interesting because I don't think people with flashbacks oftentimes are being woken up out of their sleep. So another issue with studying reactivations I've noticed is that the current clinical trials aren't using this term. And if you look at their adverse events, they'll describe things like abnormal dreams, confusional states, sensory disturbances, flashbacks. And I don't know if that's a reactivation or not. Is an abnormal dream a flashback um, or a reactivation? So it's it's tricky to tell what's actually going on. And I feel like this is a problem and people need to be clear so we can understand, you know, is this somehow only a thing that's happening to people using out there in the wild? I don't imagine it is, but researchers need to get their act together on this. Um, another fascinating thing about reactivations is it seems like for some people, uh, based on some research and also like harm reduction guidelines, that there are specific triggers. So some people uh, even very mild drugs like caffeine can uh, induce a reactivation. So that's something to be aware of. Um, some people have said that they've triggered a reactivation with meditation. Um, and another very common one for people, as we saw earlier, was sleep. So, but what's concerning a bit to me at least is that for some, they can also occur at very random times. And this could be potentially very dangerous. Um, so this is in Ralph Metzner's book. It describes a woman's experience doing 5-MeO-DMT. And then the next day, she was driving along the highway. And all of a sudden, like, 
her body had gone over to the other side of the car and she had a complete sort of lapse in consciousness but had somehow like continued driving and whatnot that's very frightening so that kind of sounds like an absence seizure a little bit um i don't it, it does sound to me like a reactivation um just a very sort of like amnesic one i suppose i'm not sure but it's definitely something to be aware of that things like this have been reported to happen you know it could be extremely rare and my guess is it, it is but we really don't have those data to to know who who could this happen to you know what do we need to watch out for how can we keep how can we keep people safe another thing too is you know even though that study was saying a lot of people did have a positive experience react with reactivations that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a harm free experience so you know a lot of people might find hypomania fun uh some people with psychosis at times find it really fun uh they like thinking that they're a messiah or whatnot people with seizures you know that can be a whole lot of fun and they can repeatedly induce them but you know over time of a lot of seizures that can cause problems like hippocampal atrophy which can affect memory and whatnot so that's to me quite concerning and given that they're sort of like these like reactivations seem so consistent and they seem to happen like during sleep and all this sort of stuff like there seems to be a neurological origin um and that really makes me want to understand what is going on it doesn't yeah so um so some people might wonder you know if somebody is having a seizure during or a seizure like sort of brain activity during the acute effects how is this leading to future uh seizure like brain activities which might be the reactivations uh so my guess and this is very much a guess is it some sort of like shockwave like phenomenon so it's not like kindling where the seizures are getting worse over time but instead they're decreasing in intensity where people are having sort of partial seizures that are less intense that last a few moments uh this might feel like deja vu uh and the interesting thing about partial seizures when they ha have that like deja vu thing is that there's often an element of depersonalization as well um and that to me sounds a bit like a reactivation you know feeling like oh i'm having this five experience again and also maybe feeling like your self experience is a bit altered um and maybe you know people who have that more uh sort of violent physical reaction where if it's a seizure causing that like it progresses throughout the brain uh from like maybe in each spot it not to me seems like maybe they're more likely to experience reactivations uh because it's sort of more shaken up their brain but who knows a lot more work is needed to understand what's going on and these are just some general ideas that i'm throwing out there uh some people might say well you know are flashbacks in general seizure like and you know they actually might be there's been people proposing a connection um even as early as like 67 1967 leary was actually in a debate with somebody who is saying that flashbacks were temporal lobe seizures so this is really not a new idea and you know maybe reactivations are a bit different but it still may be seizure like um and what's interesting is for some people hppd is actually reduced by drugs that are anticonvulsant um and benzodiazepines can actually have anticonvulsant properties so that's interesting um in contrast substances that reduce the seizure threshold such as some antipsychotics actually can increase flashbacks so that to me is quite bizarre um and again suggesting you know maybe in general like the seizure connection is something we should think about more with psychedelics um and people you know there's been studies where they'll look at people calling into the poison control um who have used psychedelics and they'll see like and what how often are people reporting that they're seeing like a seizure like phenomenon and you know that does 
happen. It's pretty rare, but you know, with LSD and ayahuasca, uh, more so than psilocybin, it does happen. Um, and other people have said, you know, there is this sort of subjective overlap with temporal lobe epilepsy and the psychedelic experience in general. Uh, so people are more likely to have seizures with typical psychedelics if they're using medications uh, concurrently. So especially lithium is a huge risk. Um, with LSD, I think oftentimes what might be happening, it's difficult to tell is people are taking fake acid um, that's actually N-bomb. And a lot of people, N-bomb is really... Um, quite a risky drug because it has a very complex metabolism and that really complex metabolism, you know, somehow might contribute to a seizure. I'm not sure, but 40% of people, uh, you know, adverse reactions to M-bomb involved in a seizure. So watch out. Um, and yeah, I think that in general, seizures might be more prevalent with psychedelics than we acknowledge. Uh, so for instance, this person, he had uh, refractory epilepsy. So he's kind of recovering, but he still had an electrode uh, in his brain, which sometimes they do that with people with seizures. And he took mushrooms and he had a spike of having some 32 seizures in a day, right? And his doctor saw this and is like, dude, what was going on that day? And he said that, you know, he took mushrooms and he didn't feel like he was having a seizure when he took the mushrooms. Um, but it did feel kind of similar. Uh, it was like a seizure, but calmness instead of anxiety. So yeah, psychedelics and seizures in general is something I think we need to consider. Um, so going back to reactivations, you know, what, what might be contributing to people having these experiences? I think administration route is huge. So if somebody's taking a route, taking it, uh, like vaporized that has a very fast onset and that's more associated with reactivations whereas actually intramuscular injection has a slower onset and that's less associated with reactivations. Uh, maybe some people who vaporize it repeatedly use it and then you have more of a sort of kindling effect. Uh, so that could be contributing, but I think a lot more work is needed. Um, and also another interesting thing about 5-MeO is it is metabolized into bufotenine partially. And there are very genetic variances in this metabolism. So some people might, you know, convert more of 5 meo DMT to bufotenine than others. Um, and maybe this is somehow contributing to people having different experiences and side effect profiles and all of that. Um, so some people might, you know, think, oh, it's just, you know, people should not be using the toads, which you shouldn't be using the toads. Uh, but I don't think it's just due to that, that people are having these experiences because, um, in a recent study, it was found that the people with like the highest risk of reactivations, um, were using laboratory tested synthetic 5-MeO-DMT in a group setting. So... Not sure what's going on there. And, and an important thing to keep in mind too is we don't really know like how bad or good is it to have a reactivation. So I don't want to like scare people, but it, it's definitely something to think about. Um, and you know, there are some differences with 5 meo DMT experiences and seizures. So some people with temporal lobe epilepsy will report olfactory hallucinations. It is rare. Um, mystical experiences, complete ones are rare with seizures, but people do com report components of it more frequently. And that to me actually kind of matches with 5-MeO-DMT. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done. So, and another thing too to stress is that it might not necessarily be bad if 5-MeO-DMT is working through a seizure like mechanism that might be good at just suggesting that it's a different way it works so maybe it's a pharmacological ect which you know ect despite sort of its bad representation in popular media it does have a really rapid rate of response people do 
improve quite quickly. It's a lot more effective than standard like SSRIs and whatnot, and it can actually increase neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and it seems to be somewhat transdiagnostic. So it's quite exciting. If the 5 amino DMT is kind of like a pharmacological ECT, that could be a good thing. Um, and then just trying to pull in some of my psychotic disorder research, um, you know, if 5-MeO-DMT is like ECT, maybe that's suggesting that there is some room to explore, could it be helpful, or at least think about it. So ECT, a lot of people with schizophrenia who've been unresponsive to other treatments were responsive, uh, so that's quite exciting. And another thing too that's interesting is 5-HD1A agonists uh, are actually helpful in treating some of the adverse events that can happen with antipsychotics. So a lot of people will have sort of what's called extra pyramidal um, like side effects. So that they'll get almost like they have Parkinson's and whatnot. And people will try to pair a 5-HT1A agonist uh, with a more typical antipsychotic and they find that that actually reduces some symptoms. Obviously, you know, your typical 5-HT1A agonist, something like Abilify having some of that agonism, it's different than 5-MeO-DMT, but who knows, you know? Um, but as mentioned earlier, I have been interviewing people with a history of psychotic disorders who then use the psychedelic and We'll get into a little bit more details about this, but one person with schizophrenia did report that they had a, an adverse time with 5-MeO-DMT. But for context, this person had supposedly taken a 2CB pill. They weren't quite sure what it was. Um, they were like, oh, I took a Pikachu. And I, lo I looked up Pikachu and it was like, oh, the Pikachu... Uh, pills are a combination of MDMA and 2CB and whatever. So who knows what was in that actually? And they smoked a lot of weed, which is very problematic for people with psychotic disorders. And then they did 5-MeO-DMT. Um, this is all at once. So I, I don't know if I like, I don't know who would handle that well. And then they ended up in the hospital for 11 days. Um, trying to get more stable, but I don't think this is indicative of what any of these substances would do necessarily to a person alone. It, it who knows what was going on there. Um, so yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but in summary, with 5-MeO-DMT, why is it different? So there's a different use history, there's a different pharmacology, different experience, different risk. Um, I just don't think we can compare it to typical psychedelics. Uh, so I think really the golden rule going forward is to really stress that 5-MeO-DMT is not psilocybin or DMT or LSD and, you know, public communication, just talking to people about it. You know, stress, it's not just a psychedelic, it's an atypical psychedelic. Uh, so future research, what can we do to learn more about how 5-MeO-DMT actually works? I think just so much more needs to be done categorizing people's experiences. So just interviewing people, understanding like the pharmacology. Is it, you know, a full 1A agonist at the postsynaptic receptors? I don't know. Um, you know, creating a measure that actually captures people's experiences instead of just throwing a bunch of psychedelic questionnaires on it. Um, and then monitoring, you know, how many people in the general public are using it, what sort of adverse events and positive um, things are happening to people. And then obviously reactivations being a huge mystery, you know, categorizing what are, experiences are people having? Who is having these experiences? How is that working in the brain, you know? Um, and then there's just so much more to learn about what 5-MeO-DMT is doing neurologically, like during the acute effects as well. So it's quite exciting. Um, just because I said I would share a bit about some of my psychosis research, um, I figured I'd talk a bit about this. We interviewed people with a 
psychotic disorder, a non-effective psychotic disorder who had then used psychedelics. And we asked them about both positive and negative uh, impacts, long and short term, um, and also to compare how psychedelics and psychosis were different or similar. So what was remarkable about this to me is most people's experience, unless they were doing like cannabis, 2CB and 5-amino DMT all at once, uh, that one guy, uh, were really normal. Um, it was like, oh, I saw a bunch of fractals. It was really cool. And, you know, I talked to my friends while I was at this party on LSC and it was a bunch of fun and all of this. So very normal. Um, and, you know, just some logistic notes people might think about, like, were they on their medication while this was happening? A lot of people did say that they briefly stopped their medication and then restarted. Um, and most people did not use during an acute episode, but a few people did. But most of the impactful experiences people had were after psychosis. So, you know, what were the negative effects aside from the guy who did too many things at once? Um, basically, nothing really out of the ordinary. So if your mom walks in on you and you're tripping, that's not a fun event. <laughs> that, that did happen to somebody. Other people complained about it lasting too long. Um, another person had a bad time because they were watching somebody who was having a, a really bad time and they felt stuck. So a psychotic person or a person with a history of psychosis on a psychedelic actually helping somebody who is having a more adverse response. To me, that's kind of mind blowing, but uh, very interesting. And some people, you know, did have panic attacks. And I feel like that is just kind of to be expected, unfortunately, with using psychedelics. That is a real risk. Uh, so what did people describe the experience to be like? Uh, what made it sort of special for these people with psychotic disorders compared to a typical response? Uh, a lot of people sort of described their thoughts as sort of flowing more freely, almost as if there weren't hurdles in front of them or obstacles. And to me, this is very interesting because a lot of people with psychotic disorders, they have a lot of cognitive difficulties as well. There are things like thought blocking, um, thought disorganization and all this stuff. And at least this person subjectively felt like they were in more control of their thoughts during the experience. Um, and another interesting thing that somebody mentioned was sort of that they were able to kind of cope with the demoralization that they ex had experienced from psychosis. So, you know, basically they had really gotten down on themselves for being psychotic or having that highly stigmatized experience. And they were able to reframe it and sort of see that like, you know, even though they had that experience, they were still able to form powerful metrics for growth. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, and then when I asked people about the long-term impacts, uh, it was quite interesting and very different than what I expected. Some people described being sort of more a easily able to switch their attention to like basically be more in control of their subjective experience. People described having insight into the fact that their hallucinations weren't real. So a lot of times people with schizophrenia, they think that their hallucinations are actually happening. Um, other people described being more motivated. So a huge thing with psychotic disorders is that people have a lot of negative symptoms oftentimes or like anhedonia, abolition. So they just don't feel motivated to do anything. For some people, this seemed to help. And then, of course, people with schizophrenia, you know, they're not immune to having other conditions as well. And so people did describe having a reduction in depression and anxiety. Um, so just some quotes describing what the insights, the experience of suddenly having insight was like. So, you know, this person described that before doing psychedelics, uh, they were very bothered by their hallucination because they were trying to look around to other people and see if they're real or whatever. And then they just became aware of it. And once they were aware that it was just a hallucination, it wasn't as distressing. 
another person describing, you know, becoming aware that a delusional narrative that they've kind of been building in their mind wasn't actually real and that they could just, you know, instead of getting hung up on those thoughts, just kind of act normal. And then their life kind of broadened out. So very interesting. Um, and then some new survey findings. So, you know, I actually just got this paper together like today, basically, but Basically, we found that for people um, with psychotic disorders who had used psychedelics, there is actually a reduction in hallucinations. And it's a pretty substantial one if you're um, familiar with statistics. So that is quite intriguing. And you might wonder, how is a drug that's causing people to have uh, like pseudo uh, hallucinations or visuals, how is that reducing hallucinations for people with psychotic disorders. That seems contraindicary. Um, and keep in mind, this is like trait hallucinations. Um, and they're not actively on psychedelics. Um, so how we think this might be working is maybe there's more sort of sensory integration where instead of people, you know, making a bunch of predictions about the world that are incorrect. So maybe like priors being overweighted where they're hearing voices from random sounds that they're more able to sort of feel all their senses and then have less hallucinations. Maybe they're able to sort of better switch between different neural networks. Uh, it's quite exciting, but I don't really quite know what to make of it, except that it is con consistent with the qualitative study. Um, unfortunately, for this survey, which I, I did design it and collect the data quite a while ago, I did not specify 5-MeO-DMT versus other psychedelics. So we can't look at that for this one. So, uh, yeah, some people did have, you know, some negative impacts. So, you know, they're really, their thing that they were concerned about, besides the guy who did all the substances at once, which is just, don't do that, please. Um, you know, they really, the, the bad thing that happened to, the people in the qualitative studies, they became psychonauts. Um, so, you know, maybe what, like, how is this bad? You know, if they're in a circle where they're using cannabis more, this can be quite problematic. So, because cannabis is actually, when I ask people what substance is the most similar to psychosis for them, people were over and over saying that cannabis was, and that it was worsening psychotic symptoms. So that is problematic. Um, but when I ask people, you know, what is the overlap between psychosis and psychedelics, people generally stated that, you know, their mind was being pushed to new limits and it was an experience very outside the norm. Um, and they were maybe experiencing more coincidences and synchronicities and had more awareness of their environment than typical. But people also made a lot of distinctions. So psychedelic experiences in general, you know, things are more novel and interesting, but they're also very clear. And people had a sense of attentional control, like they could kind of choose their thoughts and choose um, their affects. So are they having like a positive mood? Can they put themselves in a positive environment, you know, by thinking about something happy or like by changing the music or whatever? Uh, it seems with psychedelics, people said that that was a big thing of psychosis, people felt like they were being torn in all these different directions and that, you know, there is a sense of unease and it just very, it was very frightening, but also that they were absolutely certain that their delusions and whatnot were true. Uh, but yeah, anything could happen at any moment. So lots of differences there, but it's definitely going to take some time to untangle, you know, what is actually going on with these very different experiences. Uh, yeah, so cannabis and psychosis is a big problem. You know, people were saying that was the most psychosis-like that they had um, experience with any drugs. So, you know, the research kind of supports that for people using high potency THC on a daily basis, that they are more likely to develop a psychotic disorder. So it is something to think about. Um, and with, you know, all the optimistic sort of results with the interview study with people saying, oh, I had insight into my hallucinations and blah, 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 and I was motivated and blah, blah, blah. 
it's like we don't really know if that's true, right? This isn't a placebo controlled double blind study. They might just be thinking that they got better. You know, a lot of early research, you know, looking at people microdosing was saying, oh, microdosing is great. And somebody wrote a whole book about it. But then you look at the more recent research and it seems to be a placebo or expectancy effect. So we should be cautious with these results. But given that those survey findings, we're also finding that people were reporting a reduction in hallucinations and no symptom increases. We looked at a variety of symptoms. Um, you know, maybe there is some truth to what we found. Um, but yeah, another huge issue is that people are just with risk. It's been like, oh, we need to watch out for psychosis. That's the main thing we need to watch out for. And there's so much else that could potentially go wrong, you know? Um, maybe seizures could be problematic. Maybe people could experience mania, suicidal ideation, all sorts of things. And, you know, I think it's good that we try to focus a bit on understanding what these risks are so that we can prevent them and people can as safely as possible use these substances. So yeah, that is it. Absolutely wonderful, Haley. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. That was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's see. Uh, where did all What's they... happening in the chat? Yeah, oh, there's the Q&A. All right. So our dear brother Merrill says, there are many who describe the experience of 5-MeO-DMT as paradoxical in nature, as you referenced, both terrifying and ecstatic. For example, the MEQ-30 mystical experience questionnaire perfected by Dr. Fred Barrett and the original work of the Source Research Center published by John Hopkins showed an 84% success rate at achieving the complete mystical experience in a population, N equals 380, of a specific group, which is statistically higher than those reported from the general population. Any ideas why these may be so much more strati statistically higher compared to the general population who reported? Mm, so you're saying why is the mystical experience so much higher in a specific population of people? Okay, with the naturalistic use study, mm -hmm. right? I believe okay. so. Uh, my guess is that people were in an environment where, you know, they're, they were at a retreat center, right? So this is a very spiritual sort of place. So they were primed to have that experience going in. So then they had a very intense mystical experience. And, you know, if you just gave somebody 5-MeO-DMT on the street out of nowhere, they'd be like, oh my God, like, what is this? What is happening? Um, so that's a guess as to how they had such a mystical experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Heather Smith, and this is more a bit of a comment, though it's definitely something we can uh, relate with. Are you considering alternative dosages? Just because people were initially using mega doses doesn't mean we got that right. What if what people what if what has been used used is way too much? What if more meaningful experience is found at low to mid-range doses? It feels like looking at these extreme high doses is a is a save of time as a safe of time. And yeah, I can we can mm. that we find a lot of value in the low to medium doses. Absolutely. Yeah, and I will say I think these studies that have been done uh, in clinical research settings are much lower than some of the experiences people are describing going to some retreat centers where they're just like completely white out. They don't know what happened and whatnot. So I think there people definitely don't quite know what is optimal yet. And doing a, a dose finding study, uh, that could be something extremely helpful and also just you know, getting more data from naturalistic users on, you know, how are they using 5 meo DMT? Maybe people are microdosing it and maybe that's helpful. And, you know, just because microdosing didn't work for typical psychedelics doesn't mean it won't work for atypical ones. So. Yeah. Another good one from Mr. Merrill. Could the individual's ability to metabolize 5 meo DMT via either monoamine oxidase A in the brain or of a uh, periphery of via sib 2 d 6 in the liver have something to do with an individual's personal sensitivity toward both dosing and or propensity towards reactivation. 
Yes, I I think that could be a factor, um, especially with the liver metabolism. I'm quite interested in that. I'd love to see a study that is doing genotyping on people. Uh, the thing about that is you probably need quite a large sample size, but I think it's something that should be done and should be considered because there is such a wide range of responses people are having to the same dose, right? That's why that whole sort of individualized dosing regimen is a thing, I think. So yeah, that that's my best guess for part of the difference in sensitivity, but it needs to be explored. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mr. Scott is asking if we can get that contact info again from the end of the slideshow. So when we're wrapping up, if you wouldn't mind putting that back up and uh, Zoom user, will there be a replay? Yes, um, we will have this up on the five YouTube, uh, up on the five platform for uh, for viewing probably by next week. And uh, Shay, good question. The animal studies occurred in the 50s and 60s, but human use is not documented until the 80s. Can you address this? How did the researchers discover the drug? I think I can save some time. Human use with Bufo with the toad secretion was not documented to the, uh, until the 80s. Human use with synthetic um, was beforehand. And Haley, if you have anything else to add on to that one. Um, I was not even aware that people had used it synthetically prior to the, the Mossed pamphlet. So that's interesting, but yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Some of the... Um, in the Leo Zeff era, and uh, Dr. Ralph Metzner and a few others were using it. Um, I know in the 70s, um, and it could have been a little earlier than that as well. All right, which one did you want to get? Let's see this one from Mr. Merle. <laughs> All right. If we know from the direct in vitro research that 5-MeO-DMT is a septinogenic, literally changing the physiology of the nerve cells, it is it possible it can also change the relationship between the neurons and naturally occurring neurotransmitters such as melatonin and serotonin? Just a thought. Mm. Um, so I am not a basic pharmacology researcher so I'm going to try my best but I would think that if like just say that you are changing like the receptor expression of 5-HT1A you know that in turn could affect how you know something like melatonin is also um, interacting with the brain you know because it's all a balance all these different neurotransmitter systems you know they all work together they all collaborate Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've got another one from joe paul he's asking <laughs> i don't know if you can hear Very this at all we've got some chachilacas these big flying <laughs> almost like chicken turkey birds around here in mexico that are making okay, a they're... fading call no, they're <laughs> um, uh, joe paul says would an atypical hallucination during a 5-meo experience indicate a psychotic event and then also says as in perceiving a normal natural event that wasn't happening? Um, I think psychosis is very complex and I like to think of it as a neurodevelopmental condition. So the thought that somebody is just suddenly developing something like schizophrenia out of nowhere to me seems a bit much, uh, but could people be having hallucinations without insight? Maybe. Um, I haven't read about that happening much with 5 meo DMT, but it's weird and lots of things can happen. So, yeah, I don't think just saying like maybe there's one aspect that overlaps with psychotic experiences is indicating somebody's psychotic. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Any other ones on here? Well, while we're looking through, do you want to go ahead and uh, throw that contact info up on the screen again? and i'll ask one last question as well what might be the trigger mechanism for reactivations any ideas oh man um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so i think that sleep seems to be a huge one and uh maybe there's something going on where like when people are having like sleep spindles or something like that then that 
triggers like a, a micro sort of seizure or epileptiform activity that's light um, that produces an experience of a reactivation. I'm not sure. People need to be gathering data on that. Um, another thing I've come across too is that when people do substances, it seems to often be a trigger. Um, but then again, some people are describing it happening spontaneously. So that's interesting. And if it's like a seizure, which it could be, I'm not sure. It's just one idea. Um, you know, those can have a variety of different um, triggers. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, we're looking forward to doing uh, quite a lot more research around reactivations. That's one of the more exciting and interesting uh, aspects to us about 5-MeO-DMT. All right. Well, Haley, thank you so much for joining us. That was a really wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed having you on and are really looking forward to uh, to getting to work with you more in the future and getting to uh, to look into some very, very exciting areas in here. Um, and so we've got up on the screen where people can reach out to you um, via email and on Twitter or now X. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, thank you again. Um, any announcements we have? just around our training yeah 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 we've uh we've got our cohort open for our 2025 cohort so if anybody is interested in stepping into the role as facilitator for 5meo dmt there are still a few spaces left absolutely yeah absolutely and uh yeah again it was a pleasure to have all of you here with us this evening thank you so much to uh for joining us and we are joining you live from the tandava retreat center and so we uh, offer fully holistic integrative retreats with 5-MeO-DMT. And so if anyone is interested in that area, you can find us at tandavaretreats.com. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all soon. Yeah, we'll see you guys on the next webinar. Thank you all so much for showing up.